Okay, so I think we are going to start now. Eh, just before starting, antes de, de empezar, me piden de la Comisión Local de Seguridad que les recuerde que el uso del cubrebocas dentro del instituto es obligatorio. Este, entonces, bueno, por favor, que lo mantengan todo el tiempo, el cubrebocas. Eh, now, back to the, to the seminar. Eh, it is my pleasure to introduce today speaker, Inés eh, Tiger. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry for my pronunciation. I hope I'm not, not butchering your name. Uh, okay. Uh, so Ines is a, a colleague and good friend from uh, the Department of General and Molecular Botany uh, of the Ruhr University of Bochum, Germany, where she's a group leader. Uh, and Ines' uh, research has mainly focused on understanding the distinct molecular and cellular mechanisms involved in the regulation of development using fungi, uh, mainly filamentous fungi, as model organisms. Uh, her research has made uh, very important contributions to our understanding of developmental regulation at different levels, including, including the regulation of cell signaling, uh, the regulation of organelle activity, gene expression, and uh, post-transcription and regulation as well. Recently, uh, she has made very interesting discoveries on the regulation of RNA editing, which we will hear in, uh, in a moment. Uh, and just let me tell you some details about Ines' uh, scientific career. So she is, Ines is a biologist from the Ruhr University of Bochum in Germany, where she also obtained her diploma thesis in biology, which is kind of the equivalent to our master's degree. And then she performed her doctoral, th doctoral thesis also in biology, also at, at the University of Bochum. Uh, where she graduated with with honors with honors with uh, the highest distinction with summa cum laude and then she performed three uh, research uh, visits funded by the DAAD the German Academic Exchange Service two of them were at the University of Edinburgh in in the UK and a third one in the University of California at Berkeley in the US. Then she incorporated as research assistant in the Department of General and Molecular Botany of the Ruhr University of Bochum in 2013, where she became principal investigator and obtained her habilitation in 2018. She has over 30 publications with really beautiful papers And she has served as reviewer and member of the editorial board of different important journals like Molecular Microbiology, Fungal Genetics and Biology, Plus One, etc. So thank you very much, uh, Ines, for accepting our invitation. It is a real pleasure to have you here. Thanks. Please. Thank you, Leonardo, for the invitation and the kind introduction. I will share my screen and start my presentation. And I hope you can see it. Yes, it's fine. Great. So as you've already heard from Leonardo, my topic at the moment is RNA editing in fungi. And we want to know how it changes the proteome. And I would like to first give you a small introduction to fungi, although I know that several groups at UNAM are also working and at your institute are also working with fungi. So fungi are eukaryotes. And they can be uni or multicellular, which um, is termed yeast or filamentous fungi, or these are now phylogenetic groups. There are about 80,000 described species, but it is estimated that there are 1.5 to 10 million species. And I have to get the laser pointer, I think. So important is that the cellular organization is similar to animals. And you can also see this here in this tree that fungi and animals are much more closely related than fungi are to plants. Um, you might wonder why I'm working with fungi at the Department of Botany. That's because in former times, people assumed that fungi are more closely related to plants because they cannot move. But they are like animals heterotrophic and have the same cellular organization as animals. One difference is that they have no real tissues. And fungi are really ubiquitous, and you can see them here growing on, on genes. 
So fungi are important organisms, not only because there are so many of them, but also because they can do us a lot of good. So for example, fungi are symbionts. There are lichens, for example, here on the rock surface in Lanzarote, or also of trees. We eat fungi, and um, there's a lot of fermented food around, for example, also we placoche. And there are several enzymes, antibiotics, cyclostatins, that are very important drugs that are used in human therapy. But fungi also have a bad side. There are the molds, which is also not a phylogenetic term, but um, um, molds occur in many fungal groups. And they can also destroy houses and they can destroy food. And you also have pathogens of insects or of humans or of plants. That's why it's really important to get to know the fungi and also to do fundamental research on them. And if you look at the fungal tree of life, you see that we have the basal fungi, the ascomycetes and the basidiomycetes, large groups. And this tree is very dynamic and it changes from time to time because we have new evidence by next generation sequencing techniques and so on, who is related to whom and so on. You can see some of the fungi I talked about here. And this is my pet fungus. So this is Sodaria. And I will show you in the next slides why I like this fungus so much and what's the advantage of working with this fungus. So this is a life cycle of the fungus. It starts with an ascospore. And you see here, ascospores that are germinating. And what we've done here is to label a histone with YFP. And you can see the nuclei um, going into this germination vesicle. Then you have a mycelium where you also have a lot of nuclei and movement. And on this mycelium, you have the generation of sexual structures like this escogonia coil, where you have hyphae that twine around each other and are then enveloped by other sterile hyphae to form a so-called protoperitheseum. This is a spherical thing of about 30 to 80 micrometers, depending on the developmental stage. And in the protoperitheseum, you get the development of SI. These are sporangia that harbor meiotic spores. And these spores are then discharged through the tip of the fruiting body, which we call the perithesium. And what's also nice is that this is a seven days culture of Sodaria on a petri dish inoculated with a piece of agar from an older culture. You can see here these fruiting bodies easily with the naked eye, and you can see the spores that were discharged onto the rim of the Petri dish. The advantages of working with Sodaria are that it has a rather fast vegetative growth, although people working with Morospora crassa now probably are going to say that Morospora grows a lot faster, which it does, but anyway, it's still rather fast, and you can see it grow when you look into the microscope. It also has a very fast sexual cycle, of only seven days, as I uh, already told you, and it doesn't need a mating partner. It's a homothallic fungus. It makes no asexual spores, which um, we see as an advantage because we can then easily see all these um, small dots, all the fruiting bodies, and also earlier stages. And because it's a haplodicara, meaning it's a haplond during growth, the mutant phenotypes are also easily um, discernible. We can do classic and molecular genetics with this fungus, which makes it possible for us to generate homokaryotic strains. That means strains in which all the nuclei carry the same genetic background. And we do this via ascospore isolation. So we, we crack these paradisia and we isolate single spores and let them germinate, as you can see here. And because one spore is derived from one nucleus, we then have a colony of um, equal genetic background. We have a lot of methods and tools available, and I don't want to go into detail. We have just genetic and genomic tools. We can we have a genome, um, can do transcriptomics and proteomics, and I will come back to that during this talk. We have molecular genetic tools, we can easily transform it to um, gene deletion, do marker recycling. We have a rather new golden gate vector set where we can easily do gene fusion tagging or deletion vectors. And we also have biochemical and cell biological tools like um, um, co-immunoprecipitation or fluorescence microscopy. 
So, um, when I worked with Soderia and also during my time as a research assistant in Bochum, we mostly focused on how the protein bodies are formed. And we have gained um, a lot of um, results here. And we know now that several protein complexes are involved in this process and also several MAP kinase pathways like the cell wall integrity pathway and a protein complex um, we discovered in fungi that's conserved also in humans, the stripec complex. But what we don't know so much about is this later stage of fungal development. So what happens inside the fruiting body? How are the spores generated? So if you look here, you can see these sacs, which are the SI, and in them the spores are generated. And to make these SI, you first have to have a so-called dicarion. So you have to have um, cells that have two nuclei that are distinguished by some means that we don't know yet because Soderia is homothetic and can also do fruiting bodies on its own as a strain. But these two nuclei must have something that makes them distinguishable. Then at some point we have a crozier formation and we have a young ascus and we have then karyogamy and meiosis. And in the case of Soderia, we then have a, a mitosis after the meiosis. And these um, nuclei that are depicted here, they stay ordered. And so we can also do tetrad analysis and see from, from markers that we use what happened during meiosis. So, and what we also don't know really is how then this sac of cytoplasm and nuclei develops into a sac with eight spores, eight spores that are the same size, that have the same complement of organelles of probably RNAs and proteins and cytoplasm. And what's known as how this is done um, via such a skeletal uh, proteins and so um, how these nuclei are ordered, but it is not known how the membranes are made and how this is all sorted. And this is where we come to RNA editing because it was discovered that it occurs later in development at just this stage here where we know not so much about. So what is RNA editing? It's when you cannot trust the DNA, which is actually the title of this review article from Knob 2011, um, who made the scheme. And well, when you think about molecular genetics, you think of the central dogma and the sequence hypothesis that you have a DNA and you can deduce from the DNA how the mRNA will look like. And when once you know the mRNA because of the codons, you know how the protein will look like. Well, there are some things that happen in between and I only touch here the RNA level. You, for once have RNA maturation, also including splicing. So not everything that's on the DNA will go to the mRNA. You also have RNA modifications and you also can have RNA editing. And that can be nucleotide conversions or insertions and deletions. And the main types of editing are A to I editing, that's adenosine to inosine editing, or cytidine to uridine editing, sometimes also reverse editing, or uridine insertions. And RNA editing occurs in diverse RNA species. And the important thing is that the changes that are made at the RNA level could already be included at the DNA level because you have the same basis there. But for some reason, they're not included at the DNA level, but they're just brought into the RNA at the RNA level after transcription. So affected RNAs include tRNAs, where you often have editing at the wobble position to maintain transcriptional fidelity. Also microRNAs can be edited, and that leads to changes of target specificity. And what will be the topic also of this talk is mRNA editing. And this was um, shown especially for metazoan species, and it can occur in coding regions or in non-coding regions. And in coding regions, by editing, you can have different codons and so you can have a recoding and that can lead to restoration or diversification of the proteome. The non-coding regions mostly act for protection against innate immunity. So um, mRNA editing also occurs in all kingdoms of life. 
And here you can see a eukaryotic cell, in this case, a plant cell, where we have um, different DNA harboring organelles, the nucleus, the chloroplast, and the mitochondrium. And all these organelles can show editing. For example, in the plastids, you have the C2U and reverse UTC editing, especially in land plants, but also in moss. And in mitochondria, you also have C2U editing and also often U insertions. And, um, this mitochondrial editing was detected in trypanosomes. And there you have a lot of U insertions that restore open reading frames for mitochondrial proteins. And this you can see in diverse eukaryotes. This organella editing is important for the respiration of proteins because if you don't have editing, you ha don't have the proteins. It's rather different in a nuclear transcripts. So in the nucleus, um, in metazoa, you have a little bit of C2U editing, but mostly A to I editing, which leads to A to D changes, as I will show you later. And um, besides metazoa, it's now also been found in fungi. And it has also been found in bacterial transcripts. And these types of editing lead to a diversification of proteins. So from now on, now on I'm, I'm going to only talk about A to I mRNA editing because that's what I'm working on and what has been shown in fungi. And if I talk um, about fungi, I now, now talk about filamentous ascomycetes. Um, and when we compare editing in fungi to editing in mammalians and in cephalopods and bacteria, you can see that in fungi, we still don't know the enzyme. So the standard enzyme in uh, mammals is the adenosine deaminase acting on RNA, but we don't have that in fungi. And in bacteria, we have another deaminase that normally um, edits tRNAs, and it's been shown that this enzyme also can edit mRNAs. In mammalians, we have millions of editing sites, but mostly non-coding regions. In cephalopods and in fungi, we have in the range of tens of thousands of editing sites, mostly in coding regions. And in bacteria also, but only a few sites. And for cephalopods and fungi, it may be that editing leads to adaptation of proteins to specific um, functions. For example, in cephalopods, it has been shown that editing is dependent on ambient temperature and the water and changes um, proteins of the nervous system. So um, it leads to different channel characteristics, for example. In mammals also, where it is tissue specific, the editing, you have Q recording sites with functional consequences and they are also in the nervous system, but mostly um, editing occurs in the allo repeats in human transcripts and um, protects these transcripts from the innate immune response. In bacteria, there are two examples, and they all function in tuning of toxicity. When you look again at the fungal tree of life, then you can see that no editing had, has been described yet in the basal fungi. And in the basidium mycetes, there are different forms of editing at the very basal level, and there is no correlation with development yet. Also in Basilium mycetes, it's very hard to distinguish um, editing sites from uh, allelic variations because Basilium mites are dicaryotes. But in the Ascomycetes, we see something interesting. We see that in the yeasts, in the unicellular fungi, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Rhizosaccharomyces pomo, we do not have editing, which is one of the reasons why it is, was believed to be absent from fungi for a long time. But we see editing in fruiting body forming fungi, basal fungi like pyronema, but also the um, fusarium, neurospor, and sodaria species. So the questions we have at this moment is, what is the fungal editing mechanism? Which sites do become edited and which sites are of biological significance? What is the consequence of editing for protein functions? And why is there editing? To the first question, I can really only give you a hypothesis so far. So if we look at what happens during um, HOI editing, we have this adenosine with the amine group, and this is the aminated to inosine. And when you look at the pairing, then you see that adenosine pairs with uridine. 
but inosine pairs with cytidine, which pairs back with guanidine, which leads to this effective A to G exchange if you have H to I editing. And this different pairing leads to changes in the RNA structure, of course, but also to changes in the protein sequence during translation, of course. So in mammals or in metazoa, we have this enzyme, the ADAR, the adenosine deaminase acting on RNA, which has double-stranded RNA binding domains and does this catalytic um, mechanism. In fungi, we have different um, regions that are edited. So in contrast to mammals, where we have um, editing sites in um, double-stranded RNA regions, in fungi, we have them in stem loop regions. And this is similar to tRNAs. So the idea was, um, that was also proposed by the group of Jin Wangzhu, who's working on editing in Fusarium, that maybe these adenosine deaminases acting on tRNA do mRNA editing in fungi. And it was actually shown for bacteria that this is what happens in bacterial mRNAs. Unfortunately, you cannot delete these enzymes because they are crucial for um, yeah, for tRNA editing and thus they're essential. So then we go to the second question, which sites become edited and which are of biological significance. So when you look at the effect of HYI editing on mRNA proteins, um, well, you can see different changes. So this is a gene with two introns here, the stop code on TAG. And here's the respective mRNA, where you have the intron spliced out, and you have a stop here, and you have a 3 prime UTR. And if editing occurs here, for example, in one exon sequence, then you can either have a protein sequence that looks quite the same because it's a synonymous mutation, or you can have a protein with an amino acid exchange because it's a non-synonymous mutation. What we also see very often in fungi is that editing occurs at the translational stop codon, a UAG or a UGA, and these stop codons then become edited to tryptophan codons. And that means that editing runs on into, and that not editing, but translation runs on into the three prime UTR until the next in frame stop codon is met. And that leads to an elongation, a C terminal extension of proteins, a so called stop loss. And to find these editing sites, you can do either RNA-seq or mass spectrometry to look for um, evidence at the protein level. So why would you have a stop loss? Well, if you look at this proposed DNA sequence here in yellow and your transcript, when you then um, translate this transcript, you see meet me at the Italian place, stop, which um, of course tells you something gives you information. But imagine you can have more information. For example, if here you have then an HOI RNA editing event, it's changing this to UIG or a UGG, you have further translation, the Italian place where I always eat lasagna. So that means by editing and by C-terminal extension, you get more information, maybe different domains in the protein. We first looked for um, editing sites via RNA-seq, and we had actually already um, isolated fruiting body structures by microdissection and compared vegetative mycelium to these protoparacies. Yeah. And that's a nice thing about the microdissection. You can label these protoparacies here that grow on a specific membrane slide, and then the laser will cut them out, and they will be on the lid of this tube. And then you can isolate the RNA, and you can map the um, transcripts onto the genomic sequence and look for base changes, all sorts of base changes that could occur. Um, and these A to G changes are indicative of an A to I editing event. You can see by comparing vegetative mycelium to proteoparathesia that we see a large increase in this A to G substitutions. And we identified a number of transcripts and we named the genes that were affected the EFD genes for edited and protein body development. Then we wanted to know, does this really 
lead to changes at the protein level. And we wanted to look for evidence by proteomics. But we encountered a problem. And the problem is that proteomics depends on a peptide database. And this peptide database, of course, um, depends on the translation of annotated genes. But we, of course, do not have any stop loss annotations in our genomes. We have just, just the uh, gene and it ends with stop codon. So we will find by proteomics this peptide, but we will never find this one. And our solution was to make an artificial database based on known RNA-seq data and no, known stop loss events from Sodaria and also from Neurospora. And so for each protein, we added another entry, a so-called edited entry, where we have instead of the stop, a tryptophan, and then the amino acids that are added until the next stop. And with that method, we then can not only find this peptide, but also this peptide indicative of RNA editing. So we started with 794 stop loss events in Rospera perithesia and 47 stop loss events in Sodaria protoperithesia. And for Rospera, we first looked for the orthologs in Sodaria. There were 622. And over 400 of the genes had an annotated 3' UTR and a stop codon within this 3' UTR, which was fine. 129 genes didn't have an annotated 3' UTR but had an entrained stop codon after the original stop, and we included them in the analysis, making this um, almost 600 genes. And there was an overlap of 37 between the Sodaria and Rospera genes. And so we ended up with an artificial protein database of 538 entries. And we then did proteomics and found evidence for 15 stop loss editing events because we found peptides that matched to these extensions. And I don't want to look into detail here, but um, there are these 15 proteins, and six are actually from this overlap of Sodaria and Rospera, which is very nice because it shows that there are, all, there are also conserved editing events. And we then thought, um, well, maybe we can see something from an silico analysis why this editing happens. And we looked for localization changes between the original and the extended protein for domain changes, and also for the number of amino acids that were gained, which ranged between 9 and 100. And for a lot of them, we saw that we have, uh, yeah, well, maybe a minimal, but a significant localization change in P sort, or we have different motifs or domains using the eukaryotic linear motif database, or we even have different domains using the BLAST CDS search. We then went one step further and wanted to quantify the stop loss editing events at the protein level. And we teamed up with, uh, again, with a mass spectrometry facility in a, a city close to us here. And we used synthetic peptides to quantify the protein levels of the different um, variations. For this, um, we made two proteotypic peptides. That means peptides that are found in the part of the protein that is genome encoded, and one stop loss specific peptide, which is um, in the part of the protein that is in the extension. And this is an example for EFD4. So we looked for these proteins in different samples, for these peptides in different samples. Today's shaking culture, where we have no protein body development, and different. Um, Surface cultures, at three days, you only have very young fruiting bodies, at five days, more mature, and at seven days, mature fruiting bodies. And we also isolated proteins from paradisia. We then had uh, distinct amounts of these protein samples and spiked in distinct amounts of these labeled peptides, and thus could measure how much was there. And you can see here nicely these two proteotypic peptides showing the absolute level of this EFD4 protein at different stages of development. And you can see also that we have no um, stop loss specific peptide in the early stages of development with our protein bodies, but we have more at the later stages. You can see this for um, different proteins here. For EFD2, I don't know if you can see this, we have the problem that the 
this extension is rather hydrophobic and tends to go to the tube surfaces, and so we lose a lot of this. But what we can see is that editing occurs late in development and that we find evidence for um, it at the protein level. We then also did proteogenomics. This is when you match peptides not to a peptide database, but to a six-frame genome translation. And it's also a method that you can use for annotation of genomes in phylogenetic groups where you don't have a lot of information and not a lot of sequenced genomes yet. So in addition to the standard peptides that you match to this um, deduced protein sequence, you can have then the identification of peptides from within the C-terminal elongations. And with a novel proteogenomics approach, um, where we did the novel peptide sequencing and alignment to the six-frame genome tr um, translation, we can then also find peptides harboring the single amino acid variations, where you have one non-synomonous mutation, and also peptides overlapping these stop to tryptophan exchanges, where you also have one mutation, so to say. And with this, we were able to identify 113 of the single amino acid variations and hundreds of proteins. And you can see here the variations, for example, T2A um, variations. And you can see one example here, where you have a peptide where there's a T here and an A here. And you can clearly distinguish these two peptides by mass spectrometry. And you can then see that in the early stages, only this um, genome encoded peptide is present. And in the later stages, you also have the peptide resulting from editing. We also found stop loss events by protein genomics, 15 in total. And one example is transcription factor white color, color one, which is important for fungal development and also for circadian, uh, for the circadian clock. And it has been studied in detail in ROSPOR. And the normal stop code on what we hear, and by editing, you get an extension. You can see here in blue, this is the peptide that was observed in our proteogenomic study. And this extension leads to the gain of a new domain in white collar, namely histone deacetylase domain, which may account for some epigenetic effects you may have during development when you see, or when you look at white collar one. So now the next question was, what is the consequence of editing what the protein function? And what we did was to delete some of these EFD genes to look at if there's anything you can see in terms of development, in terms of maybe the ESCO scores. And actually we did see something and I show you um, results for EFD two, four and five. And this is an ESCOS of Soderia where you see these eight spores very nicely, the same size, and ordered. And in the EFD2 mutant, you have some SI where you have only seven spores, and this last spore is rather big. And this is in about 5% of the SI. We also see that, in general, the spores are smaller than in wild type, and we have a greater distribution of size, which you can see here, where we um, analyzed several thousand spores from wild type and from two different EFT2 strains. And you can see that they are smaller and we have a greater variation. Here are two other mutants. Again, this is the wild type. And you can see here um, a petri dish that was cut. And you see the pyrethesia from the side. And you can see nicely that they sit on top of the agar at the agar air interface. And inside the, S side, uh, inside the pyrethesia, we have these Ascus rosettes with the export SI. The Delta EFD4 mutant also makes pyrethesia and they sit on top of the agar, but it makes few spores only. And it has a um, kind of weird Ascus phenotype where all the melanin, maybe because there are no spores, seems to go to the Ascus wall. So you have these black SI. The Delta EFD5 mostly makes only premature fruiting bodies, these spherical protoperithesia, and they are all inside the agar and not on top. And then the rare cases where we have a perithesium, it contains only very few spores. So we can conclude that the EFD proteins function in ascospore generation. 
we did a, a bit more work on EFT2, where we quantified the size of the spores and the roundness. And we did this using Fiji. Um, and you, if you look here at the spores, you can uh, take the so-called ferrets diameter, which is the largest line you can lay through a spore. And you can plot that for a wild type here in, in blue and for the mutant in red. And you can see already again that the spores are smaller, but they are also rounder. So this is completely round and this is not round. And you can see that the wild type is somewhere in between and um, the mutant has rounder spores. We then plotted this in a violin plot. So this, these are the spores of wild type. They range from 20 to 25 microns mostly. And when you have the EFD2 mutant, um, you see that the spores are smaller, but we have some outliers that maybe are these very big spores at the end of some S sign. And you see a clear difference in these violin plots in comparison to wild type. If you put in the EFD2 gene again, tag with GFP at the end terminal part, you see that you can complement this phenotype. So this is back to wild type situation. I already showed you this table where you saw that the EFD proteins tend to gain new signals and domains. And I've depicted three proteins here, EFD2, which is an RNA binding protein that gains a putative nuclear localization signal in this extension. EFD4 is another RNA binding protein that gains a putative peroxisomal targeting signal. And EFD5 is a phosphatase where editing needs to completion of this domain of unknown function. And we wanted to know if these uh, predictions are true and for example, if the NLS of EFT2 is working. So we wanted also to know is editing required for probable nuclear localization of EFT2 in later stages. So when you look at the life cycle again, you do not have any editing here during vegetative growth and early development. So you will only have a short EFT2 version without a nuclear localization signal. In later stages, you should have a longer variant of EFD2 with a nuclear localization signal. And so we took again the strain carrying this, this construct where we have an N-terminal GFP and if, if you have editing, this protein will become longer. We first looked in vegetative cells. So we have um, here a Petri dish with the glass light um, with agar medium on top and the fungus can grow here. Maybe you can see here the growth front. And we look at this um, hyphae and we have our GFP tech EFT2 and we can see it in the cytoplasm, but it's absent from the nuclei. And we have a uh, labeling of nuclei here with the histone marker. If you look later, we take um, these parathesia from a petri dish and we crush them and then we look at the S sign. And here we did also look for GFP EFT2 and you see here this accumulation in these punctate structures. And we did a DAFI staining where we got a lot of help from Leonardo um, in performing the staining in Sudaria also. And you can see that there is co-localization in these late st stages of development. So that was fine. <clears throat> but then we wanted to know, is editing really required or can it go to the nucleus if there's no editing. And for this, to this end, um, we generated several allelic versions. So let me take you through this busy slide, please. So we, we made three alleles. First, we had this native allele or the TAG. This can become edited to a TGG and then you get a longer version. So in a normal strain, this should in SI always be the long version. We then also made a mutation to TAA where no editing can occur. So you will always have a stop here and you will always have the short version. And we made a TGG mutation where you always will have the long version because you have no stop here and you will always have translation into the three prime UTR. Then we looked at DNC images of spores, DAPI staining, the EFD2 and the merge. And as you already saw, we have here a co-localization with the native allele with the DAPI signal. But we also have a co-localization here with the TAA allele, but a stronger co-localization here 
with the TGG and yield versus always edited. Nevertheless, we cannot say at the moment that editing is required for ERP2 nuclear localization, although I have to say that, that these are only um, EP fluorescence images and not confocal images. So that leads me already to the last question. Why have certain fungi evolved editing and others not? Or maybe we haven't just found editing in other fungi yet. Well, I give you several pictures that I showed in this talk. So we know that HI mRNA editing occurs in filamentous ascomyces that make protein bodies. We know that the level of editing increases during development, and we know that genes affected by editing have functions in ascospore generation. So our working hypothesis at the moment is that RNA editing of certain genes is required for adaptation of proteins to what we might call fungal pregnancy, so during the generation of offspring. However, what we do not know completely yet is if it's only the generation of s and ascospores, or if editing is also important for maybe outfitting ascospores with different protein versions to be able to germinate in diverse environmental conditions. And that's a hypothesis that has to be tested. So that leads me to the conclusion. I've told you that we have a fungus that in the vegetative phase has a vegetative mycelium, has its DNA, makes its mRNA, makes its protein with the standard function. When it enters the sexual phase and makes fruiting bodies, we have the onset of A to I editing. And we have increasing levels of editing here. We have still, this, still the same DNA and we have still standard mRNA because these levels of editing are never 100%. So we still have proteins with standard functions. But we also have edited mRNAs that may lead to proteins with single amino acid variations that may have modified functions. And we have also edited mRNAs that are edited at the stop codon, where we have an extension of the protein at the C terminus, and we may have a protein with additional functions. And so I would like to thank you for your attention and also my group in Bochum and we've made it so far through the corona crisis they also may be meeting only by a zoom like we are doing now I would like to thank Ulrich Kirk and Christopher Grefen and their groups for providing infrastructure and we have several collaborations and I would like to especially thank the group of Albert Dickmann and especially Bernhard Blank Landesammer for the very great um, collaboration with the proteomics and proteogenomics project Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. It was very nice. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes, uh, thank you very much, yeah. Ines, for such a clear and interesting talk. Um, I noticed that one of the proteins that was affected uh, by this editing was a catalase peroxidase. And it was really, the effect was very uh, large because I think the editing results in the addition of about 100 amino acids. So that's a really big change. So I wonder if you have tried to um, uh, study the, the effects of this addition, like um, in vitro, so the properties of the enzyme could be analyzed in vitro and compared to the uh, non-modified protein. And also uh, the effects of the mutation of, of a protein like that. Have you, are you considering to, to study that? We haven't yet started this catalase peroxidase. Um, we had to choose some that we were certain that were at least conserved. So um, we've been looking into the RNA binding protein so far and then some signaling proteins, but not the catalase. But it might be interesting, especially since, as you mentioned, you can do in vitro experiments with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It, uh, the, so the enzyme that uh, performs these modifications is not known. Uh, is that yeah. right? Yes. Mm. It will be so interesting to mutate that one. <laughs> That's true. So there's some evidence that it might be these enzymes that added tRNAs normally. 
um, because um, the group of Jin Rong and Fusarium, I think, um, try to delete them, which doesn't work, and it also doesn't work in Sudaria. Um, but they did an overexpression, and they got somewhat higher editing levels, I think. Um, then in bacteria, we have these um, tRNA editing enzymes, and they also edit mRNA. And they even found the residues that are responsible for this um, mechanism. But these um, sites are again not conserved in fungi. So we're still not sure. And at the moment, we're trying to set up a mutant screen to, um, yeah, to look for regulators. Mm. We also had some um, ideas about other deaminases that might be the candidate enzyme. But until now, it doesn't look as if we have found it. And have you tried to overexpress the edited proteins in, in vegetative tissue? Yes, um, but so far we haven't seen any effect. Any effect. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ines. Yeah, welcome. Ines, <clears throat> here, Wilhelm. Uh, nice very nice you. work. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure hearing you. Uh, I, I was uh, interested also about the uh, catalyzed peroxidase, and I was uh, trying <laughs> to ask you uh, about that, but uh, uh, I would like to know about the white color one mutation. Uh, do you know what uh, effect does it have to have an additional sequence? Well, the domain that it gains is a histone deacetylase. And there's been some results on epigenetic effects also of white collar. But you have to keep in mind that editing occurs in development and that these effects might also, may only be present then in fruiting tissues. So, and I don't think that anyone in Rospoa has analyzed white collar during fruiting body development, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so what it might do as it is a transcription factor and goes to the nucleus anyway, is to modify um, the chromatin in some way. And have you expressed it uh, in, in during the vegetative uh, hyper? No, I haven't actually, because I think that the white collar field is rather busy already. <laughs> so I feel, yeah, okay. I stuck to the other proteins. And I okay. thought that maybe someone in the Norospora community would find it rather interesting and have a look there. Someone who's maybe already working on white collar, because, yeah, that may be very interesting. Okay, thank you. I, I also have a question. So... The deletion of these three genes you studied, F, EFD, 2, 4, and 5, so it, it does not produce any defect in the vegetative phase for any of the genes, the deletion. I found rather interesting, not only, it, it would seem like you have two proteins, one that works on the uh, somatic phase and another one that works on the uh, sexual development, but the elimination of the, the development of the of the protein that works on vegetative uh, on the vegetative phase does not produce any defect right yes that's true for these three genes i see we have we have another gene a sorting uh, nexin gene okay. where you have also effects during vegetative growth i see um, i think there are different groups of of genes that are edited so for example um, you also have um, these genes that I didn't talk about where you have a wrong annotation because there is a stop codon in the open reading frame. And by editing, this can be repaired. And these genes, they tend to be expressed only in development. But these other genes, like these stop loss genes, they, they tend to be higher expressed during development or um, developmentally regulated. We've also seen that by RNA-seq, but they still sometimes seem to be expressed in vegetative growth. And yes, then I would also think that they should have a vegetative effect, the deletions you right there. Um, I haven't checked whether these EFT2, 4, and 5 genes 
have another differential expression than the other one that we now deleted where we see an effect. That would be interesting to check. Right. And I also found very interesting that it, this process only takes place during sexual development. Even when you do not know the exact protein that works on the editing, do you know anything about the regulation? Uh, does it depends on the mating type genes or do you have any clues? Do you have any idea on how this is regulated? No, I can't say actually. So we have um, different mutants where we have checked for editing. So for example, mutants would, that make only protoparatisi. And these mutants have less editing, but that may be because they do not reach the right state. For example, the NOX1 mutant doesn't show much editing. Um, we have other mutants, uh, transcription factor mutants that had defects later in development and some also during spore generation. And there we see a, a change, a dynamic change in the editing sites that we can detect in RNA-seq. And that was also the case, um, I think in Rospora, where also the group of Jinrong checked different stages of development in different mutants. So you get a, yeah, a shift in editing sites, but nothing like, yeah, where you could really say yes. that that's, you know, because you're in a transcription factor mutant, it could be that this gene that you have looked for before is just not expressed, right? right. And yeah, but yeah. that's really yeah. something we want to um, check with our mutant screen now. We hope to see something. Right. And do fungi that uh, has lost sexual development has editing, RNA editing? Is any information available? It's difficult because there are not so many RNA-seq data on fruiting tissues. And um, we, um, we actually looked into the Skysosavromyces um, RNA-seq data set from meiosis to check there, but we don't find editing there. So it's not, it's not related to meiosis. And then if you have fungi that have lost sexual development again, I would guess that they just do not reach the right state again. Right, yeah. And the idea was also that maybe it's in special circumstances and maybe also during conidiation or during pathogenicity, um, or maybe as I see this question in the chat, um, during stress conditions, and we haven't yet found any condition. I would love to find a condition because I would love to be able to artificially induce editing but so far, no, no success. So not with pH changes, not with oxidative stress, not with, with temperature or something. I see. Okay, very nice. Uh, um, I'm sorry, is there, yeah, yeah. Nayeli. I saw, that, hi, Miss. I saw that you yeah. use a, a construction with EDF2 fused with GFP, right? With a promoter, constitutive promoter, and did you use that construction in order to complete the mutant in EDF2, right? But yes. have to overexpress that protein. And what's the phenotype of the strain that overproduct or over overexpress EDF2 or the other one proteins for editing? Yeah, interestingly, so we've looked closely into EFD2 almost only at the moment. And if we um, overexpress the native gene, we do not see any change. But then the, yeah, um, the mm -hmm. expression level of GPD and this gene in development doesn't differ very much, you know, so from our analytic data. Um, So I wouldn't say that there's a, diff, uh, a large change in expression levels. And I wouldn't say it's an overexpression. It's probably kind of a misexpression, yes, but we don't see anything there. And yes, it would also be good to have a um, native promoter. Um, and sometimes I would like to. Um, what we've also tried is to um, introduce these changes. Mm allelic changes at the native locus. We've done this for EFD4, for instance, or we just um, change the stop codon. Mm. And um, then it's this time, this was not GFP tag because that was too complex to do, but um, we did that. And there we see that if we reintroduce the native 
allele, we see a complete complementation. And interestingly, if we introduce the TAA allele, so the always short, or if we introduce the TGG allele, which is the always long, in both cases, we do not have complete uh, complementation, which leads to the idea that you need both variants of the protein in that case. Okay, thanks. <laughs> and the ascospores that were produced by the mutant EDF2, are they uh, able to germinate? Yes. yes, although I have not checked, especially these um, rather big spores, because it's difficult to isolate them once you had them under the microscope. Okay. But they normally germinate, so it's easy to, to generate ascospore isolates. I haven't yet found a mutant that, that cannot germinate. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay, if the people that is following us on YouTube has any question, I can, I can read the questions for you. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, thank you very much again, Ines, for your very nice talk. Thank you. It's it was been a pleasure. pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. <laughs> thank Bye, you. Ines. Thank you, Ines. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I will. I hope to see you soon in the next. Yeah, I hope to see you soon. Yeah. Soon. Okay. <laughs> Take Bye. care. Bye. You too. Bye.